Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Mount Rainier National Park is the most recent unit of the national park system to announce that you'll need a reservation to enter the most popular areas of that park. At the same time, Shenandoah National Park has announced that a pilot program it has been running for two years for access to old rag will be permanent going forward. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. Reservation systems to get into national parks are controversial. Some folks argue that they hinder spontaneity in travel. Others like the assurance of knowing they can get into a national park such as Arches or Rocky Mountain or Glacier at a specific time on a specific day. To explore the issue of reservation systems in the parks, we're joined today by Cassidy Jones, the Senior Visitation Manager for the National Parks Conservation Association, who keeps an eye on these programs, how they're operating, and whether they make a difference. We'll be back in a minute with Cassidy after a short break. Gear up for 2024 with Interior Federal Credit Union. Synchronize all your accounts in one place with their tool, Money Management. Money Management allows you to create budgets to fit your lifestyle, set up goals for the future, monitor your account and loan balances with one login, track debt, and more. Apply for membership at interiorfcu.org and sign up for digital banking to get started. Federally insured by NCUA. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. So welcome to The Traveler, Cassidy. Thanks so much for having me. You know, it's great to have you. As I mentioned in my introduction, you are um, the Senior Visitation Program Manager for the National Parks Conservation Association. And in recent weeks and, of course, in recent years, we're seeing not a stampede towards reservation systems for the National Parks Service, but certainly um, some new ones are cropping up. Um, just recently, we had Mount Rainier National Park announced that it, you're going to require a uh, reservation to get into the park during peak hours in the summer. I think Yosemite's got one. Rocky Mountain, of course, long has had a, a reservation system to get in. Arches National Park. Um, and then there are, are niche reservation systems, I guess I'd call them, at, at Zion National Park, you know, if you want to hike Angel's Landing, um, at Acadia National Park, if you want to um, drive to the top of uh, Cadillac Mountain. Why is the Park Service moving to reservation systems? Good question. And the way I might talk about these reservation systems that you just listed, Kurt, is, first of all, pilot systems, almost all of them, aside from Cadillac. So these are tests early tests, and they are in a few different categories, right? A, one of the categories is reservation systems for park entry, right? Just to get through the gate, that's arches, that's Yosemite. Reservation systems for corridors, so areas that are highly trafficked, going to the Sun Road and Glacier, the Bear Lake Corridor in Rocky Mountain. And then site-specific reservation systems. So Angels Landing, Sunrise at Cadillac, um, at Zion and Acadia, respectively. So while they are all you know, reservation systems, they're a little bit different. And they're importantly pilots at this time, most of them. A bit of like recent history for why these are happening now is unsurprisingly, when we tell so many of these stories, is the opportunity that was presented in 2020 and 2021 as parks in all sorts of places were adapting to the national health emergency of the COVID pandemic. And it kind of created this situation where parks that had been thinking about ways to manage overcrowding or traffic congestion in the parks had this opportunity to try something, to design a pilot, and had a reason to do that for managing for public safety. 
So we saw some of those first things come online in 2020 and 2021, and now we've just seen them refined and changed at places like Rocky Mountain and Glacier, where they've kind of been operating the longest. What do, you, what do you mean refined and changed? I mean, I, I look at them and they, they seem almost like a cookie cutter approach. You know, you, you're coming in between 7 a.m. and I think, is it 3 p.m. in the afternoon? You need a reservation. And that seems to be what most of these parks are, are adopting. Yeah. We well, take a, someone who's paying very close attention, perhaps to see the changes that are happening year after year. So the phrase that Park Service uses is adaptive management. And it's the phrase I like to use too. It's a really important tenet of a pilot system as they're adaptive. So they're making small micro changes as a season goes on and certainly some slightly larger changes every year to try to create the conditions in the park for visitors that they are aiming for. So an example here is, you know, the hour that parks start requiring reservations, for instance, at Arches National Park, it over the course of a couple of years, they actually like, reduced the amount of the day where a reservation was required, right? It had to be until five o'clock in one year, I may have that slightly wrong. And now it, then it was only until four o'clock, right? So they reduced the amount of the day because they found that, you know, not as many people were coming at the very end of the day. And they felt like they didn't really need the reservations at the end of the day. So that's what I mean by adaptive management and making small changes to improve these pilots for the conditions they're trying to create for visitors and for staff and resources. But I think um, we got a little bit a field of your original question, which is why I gave you the technical answer, right? The pandemic created an opportunity to start some pilots that created, you know, a good, a good stage to start seeing some of these things. But I think the broader answer for at least the parks that we've listed here, there are parks that have been, you know, experiencing overcrowding and traffic congestion in ways that were increasingly um, challenging for managers, unappealing for visitors, and deleterious to the resources that the parks were created to protect for many years, especially in the Intermountain West, which is where we've seen so many of these reservation systems. You know, at NPCA, we've been hearing that from superintendents saying, you know, if I don't figure out this visitation and crowding challenge, I'm not going to be able to do the next things. Like we've got to get a handle on this. It's taking so many of our resources to try to manage all these people in these busy seasons. So I think the larger answer to your question about why is it was time to make some changes to try some things. People acknowledge that the parks were not pleasant places to be and not being adequately protected and very stressful places for managers to try to do their jobs. And some things needed to be tried to kind of carve out a a better future um, for all of those things I just listed. Are the reservation systems designed to reduce congestion in the parks or is it an effort to, to redistribute that congestion? Oh, great question. And I would say it depends and both. So I like to think about some of the reservation systems that we're seeing in kind of two categories. There are the parks that are using timed entry, right? Which is different than just something like ticketed entry. Plan what I mean here. Timed entry is being used at Arches National Park. Their challenge at Arches was that everybody was kind of coming into the park at the same general time. So you had these big spikes in arrivals. We often say, you know, 10 to 2. I'm sure it's slightly different in the middle of the summer when it's super hot. And they were just getting these big bottlenecks of people. We've seen the images of the cars stretching out. Um, Even after kind of the entrance redesign, they were stretching out onto the main highway on 191. And it wasn't sustainable. Their goal was to really spread the use out spread the congestion out over times of the day and also over days of the year. They're interested in kind of flattening that visitation curve so that you didn't have these spikes 
um, from 10 to 2, but you also didn't have these spikes on Memorial Day and Labor Day and 4th of July, right? We're like spreading the use out over the days of the year. So timed entry is often trying to get people to just not all come at once. Same numbers of people are often accommodated. They're just not all there at the same time. Your other question, I think the other alternative in which we're kind of trying to manage congestion um, in general or limit congestion, can you clarify, Kurt, what you mean by managing for congestion in the park? Well, I I think there's two aspects of that. One is just the sheer number of people in a national park. And I, I think it's easy to see that some of these parks just don't have the the landscape to accommodate an unlimited number of visitors. Um, the other aspect is, let's take Arches National Park. If you have um, timed entry, that doesn't mean you can't have congestion at Delicate Arch or at the windows. And so I'm just wondering how these reservation systems address those kinds of problems. Let's do talk about that a little bit, how congestion at specific sites is being managed. So this is not so much traffic congestion. It is a little bit because it's about availability of parking, but it's like physical bodies, right? Like humans on the trail from Wolf Ranch going to Delicate Arch. Another example folks have used as like physical humans on the mist trail at Yosemite, right? Or and Old Rag in Shenandoah or Angel's Landing in Zion. Absolutely. Probably so others. A park I feel really kind of versed to talk about here because I understand the research and the data that they've collected. It's been so terrific and robust and public is Arches. And Arches defined for three kind of big locations in the park, some desired conditions for visitor experience. And they monitored during the timed entry system, just sort of, you know, whether or not they were hitting those desired conditions. And the findings from their research and their monitoring has shown that folks really feel like crowding issues at those three locations were not problems when they visited under timed entry. So the figure I have in front of me is 79% of people surveyed in 2022 during the timed entry system did not consider parking, people walking on the road, or like too many people at that physical part of the park to be a problem. So we are seeing some parks really trying to hit some numbers, right? Some thresholds of people in the park at once that creates an experience of reduced crowding for visitors inside the park. So they're actually having these visceral feelings that they can get around, you know, with ease and there's not too many other people around them kind of impairing their view shed or what have you. We're kind of hitting that sweet spot. So that is a goal at a lot of parks and folks are figuring out creative ways to monitor that. Yeah. And with the time entry, can they, the, the parks manage that by reducing the number of entries throughout the day? You know, like uh, maybe have um, more at two o'clock in the afternoon when there's fewer people showing up and less at uh, eight o'clock in the morning when people want to come. Yeah. Let's go back two beats to this concept of adaptive management, right? This is a factor, you know, how people are feeling as well as the more kind of concrete things like the availability of parking that the park service will take a look at and kind of build into their model to influence whether they're going to dial back the number of reservations available or dial it up, right? So that's the adaptive management that happens over the course of the season and certainly season over season. Um, and also allows them to, this kind of adaptive management also allows them to accommodate the fact that sometimes folks just don't show up for their reservation, right? 
Yeah, that's another thing we hear from time to time on the Traveler that, you know, um, whether it's a, a timed entry reservation or whether it's a campground reservation, you know, some people just make those reservations and, well, if I can't make it, I can't make it. And how how do parks deal with that? I don't know how recreation.gov deals with that. Um, I know it's a problem. There are so many complicating factors, as you've noted, for being able to do that on the fly um, that have some competing interests. So if you can imagine yourself as a ranger who's at um, an entrance booth and part of your goal is to kind of make sure people are oriented, but you're trying to move people through that gate, right? And if they have more experience, more questions, you're hoping they'll make it to the visitor center right beyond the gate. It, especially with the timed entry system, if you're spending so much time with each visitor that your line is backing up, you're going to have people who have a reservation in their hand who are pretty unhappy that they made this reservation. They're still waiting in line. And we did see that in 2022, the first year of Arches pilot, for instance. So it's in your interest to keep them moving. Now imagine that you are being asked to make sure that every reservation is filled and suggesting that you could just get on a computer and look at rec.gov and see if there's somebody who hasn't quote unquote checked in yet. Like you think about how much time something like that would take. It's, it's not a great task to be doing for every single person who comes through the gate. So the way folks have kind of adapted to this challenge is similar to what airlines do, right? They're oh, okay. overselling. Correct. So folks have found that there's a, you know, a fairly consistent um, rate, especially, you know, at certain times of the day, that um, uh, rate of no-shows, and they can pretty comfortably just oversell to that rate of no-shows and and feel confident that the reservations will be maximized while accounting for the fact that some people also don't show up. That was a long answer to kind of a simple question, but I think it's... um, It's helpful to evidence that the Park Service, certainly while there are all these technological and contracting challenges with places like Rec. or with, um, you know, third parties like Rec.gov, they are working very hard to use the tools at their disposal, uh, at their disposal to have kind of creative solutions to make sure that, you know, the parks are available to just as many people as possible while hitting those desired conditions. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, in the case of Zion National Park, and maybe you can't answer this because you're not on the staff at Zion National Park, they came up with the the Angels Landing um, reservation system, ticket system. Um, I can certainly understand that from a a human safety standpoint. I've I've been to Angels Landing several times um, back in the last century, I think it was, before the crowd showed up. Um, I'm not sure I'd do it again today. But it's in that narrow canyon where it's easy to have congestion. And I'm, I, I guess I'm wondering in the case of Zion, rather than coming up with the reservation system for Angels Landing or maybe in addition to why they haven't gone to timed entry for the whole park. For the whole park, yeah. Or at least the Zion Canyon portion. Right, that corridor model that we talked about at the top. That narrow, that narrow cord corridor with very little parking and the temple of Sinawava gets uh, jammed with people wanting to, to wet their feet in the Virgin river. And it, it, um, you know, once upon a time, the superintendent, you know, told me we have to teach people how to behave in a national park. Mm-hmm. We have 5 million people in a largely in a seven mile corridor, right? That's where most people go. Right. Any insights into that? Into the Zion situation. What Angel's Landing, if I can start there, gives me a chance to talk about that I didn't mention yet related to your first question about why. In my understanding of the history of managing access in national parks, particularly for certain experiences, the motivation is often safety. So think about requiring a permit to climb the cables on Half Dome, right? That is a decision that was made many years ago because of the concern about how many people were getting on the top of Half Dome and what kind of contingency plan folks had for an emergency in which, you know, 
a thunderstorm comes through and there's lightning on the top of it. Okay. It's a big problem. It's a big concern. It is. Yeah. yeah. And it was a really um, helpful motivator for considering a, ta- a much more direct management tactic like having a permit system. So safety is often a key reason why parks will try this tactic and a good one too. And it's really the motivator for Angel's Landing as well. I mean, you know, as well as me, that Angel's Landing is a very busy place and it's also a pretty precipitous one and has a a probably higher (laughs) risk kind of profile than other places. We've certainly seen lots of um, fatalities, many more than anybody would be comfortable with on Angel's Landing. So that permit system, in my view, is, is really about safety, but it's also a way to introduce people in the Zion area to the concept of managing access in a direct way and offering an opportunity for everyone, whether they're park service employees or, you know, commercial use authorization permit holders, guides, just visitors who come a lot, adapt <laughs> to something new and understand how it can serve their interests. And I do believe that we're seeing a lot of folks saying, you know what, this really is a much better experience. <laughs> Folks who yeah, visited it, Angels Landing before and yeah. after the permit system, yeah. so it's a, it's kind of a soft launch into that concept for like the whole Zion community, if that makes sense. Well, it, it does because the congestion is still an issue in Zion Canyon. Um, Angel Angels Landing permits, to the best of my knowledge, did not solve that congestion problem. And I know that I know the park staff there has been working since at least 2016, maybe 2015 to come up with a management plan, a visitor use management plan, they've acknowledged that there's too many people there. There's too many um, problems, too many social trails, too many impacts, not enough stuff to clean the bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on. And here we are seven years later, eight years later, and they're still working on the plan. I don't know how much of it is a, is a park service issue and how much of it is a, a political issue. Cause I know the, the superintendent has, I don't know if it was a superintendent, Specifically, but I've heard from the Park Service that Utah's congressional delegation does not want to see um, timed entry at Zion, and I'm surprised they went along with one at Arches. So you've got you've got that aspect to deal with as well. Yeah, and I think you've hit on something that is you know something we were hoping to talk about a little bit later on in the conversation, which is you know are are lots more parks going to do this? And, you know, I think that we've seen this approach on a park by park basis, dependent on so many factors. Is it needed? Does it feel like it's actually going to solve the problems? Because not every single system is a perfect fit for every visitation kind of phenomenon that affects the park. and. There's all kinds of political considerations as well for the where a park sits and the community's support that it has nearby and at the county and state levels, um, as well as just sort of the expertise and the capacity of the staff and the support staff at those places. You're right that Zion has been paying attention to this visitation and congestion issue for a very long time and working pretty diligently on a lot of um, different approaches and draft plans that it's gotten feedback on from communities and working with cooperating agencies. And it's also like a very complicated place and a very challenging place. My concern with Zion is that, you know, visitation continues to climb. And the longer we wait to think about visioning visitation differently, that the more and more difficult it will be to think about doing things differently. Yeah, absolutely. This is Kurt Rappenshack with National Parks Traveler. We're talking today with Cassidy Jones, the Senior Visitation Program Manager at the National Parks Conservation Association about 
reservations to get into national parks. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. National Parks Traveler has launched the National Parks RVing Guide, the definitive guide for RVers seeking information on campgrounds in the national park system. The guide is now available free through the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. If you're a traveler who wants to explore the national park system, you'll want this app. The guide is packed with details for campgrounds in more than 70 national parks across the country, searchable by park, state, or region. You'll also find feeds of the traveler's content, including our latest stories and podcasts. Download the National Parks RVing Guide and start planning your next trip today. Okay, we're back now with Cassidy Jones from National Parks Conservation Association talking about visitation, congestion, and reservation systems to get into national parks. You know, Cassidy, one of the things that we've heard a lot at National Parks Traveler about with these reservation systems, and I'm sure the NPCA staff has heard about it, I'm sure the National Park Service staff has heard about it, they kill spontaneity in travel. Well, how do you deal with that? How do you How do you say, yes, those days are over, we're sorry, we're going to have to be more um, deliberate in how many people we let into the parks? Yeah. Good question. Uh, I'd like to reference here a, an academic who I've worked with uh, for a lot on these kinds of studies, who's been uh, working on this for a long time and kind of looking at the the data about visitor experience particularly, right? Like when we ask visitors to reflect on their experience and what they like, what they want, um, he's tracked change. And the profile that, that he creates for me is we really are seeing folks coming to the National Park Service who are seeking some more predictability. Often creates this profile of, you know, the mom with a van full of kids who's driven for four hours and she's not pulling into Moab without a hotel reservation, right? No way in heck would she have ever thought of doing that. It's kind of similar, right? We're seeing more people who are saying, you know, if I'm I'm coming, I want a sense of security and assurance about the experience I'm going to have. I want to slot it in with the many other things I'm trying to do. Many of those things, by the way, I've had to make a reservation for or booked with an outfitter or made a plane reservation, what have you. And this alternative universe for some parks, right? We're not talking about every park to the security of knowing when you're going to enter the park or whether you'll enter the park is you come to Arches at eight in the morning, even if you tried to come a little bit earlier, it didn't quite happen for you and you waited in line for an hour and then the gate swung shut because they were at parking capacity and you're told to come back in three hours and hopefully it works out better. So that's the alternative, right? I think it's important uh, to remember that we don't really have this third way, which is we go back to what these busy parks were like 20 years ago, because that's just not happening. <laughs> so, oh, you never know. Well, I, you know, in, in, in 2016 or 2015, uh, then um, director of the National Park Service, John Jarvis, told me that national parks were losing relevance with the American public. And just a handful of years later, and I don't know if it was um, because of COVID, certainly COVID contributed it, but Americans fell back in love with the national parks. And so, you know, I don't know if it's going to continue to climb upwards or if it's going to be a roller coaster going forward. But um, no, I, I, I get it in terms of um, the certainty for somebody who's, you know, planned their once in a lifetime vacation to, to arches and they want to make sure that they can get through the gate. Um, but then there is that other component of American society that are, um, free to travel when they want to travel and they might be on the road for six months and they might want to drive through Moab and go into the park and, Oh, I didn't have a reservation. What do you mean? I can't come in. It's true. You know, I think, you know, the true, then, the answer to your question as posed earlier might have been, yeah, (laughs) at least in the busy season, it does make spontaneity more difficult. What I would push back on in in these, the idea that it's totally gone because all these reservation systems do just have an operational window, right? Whether it's seven to three or it's eight to four, or or in some places it is at 6 a.m. 
Um, and then there's the time outside of those windows that are still just available. Folks can come on in whenever they'd like to after 3 p.m. or before 7 a.m. So no, exactly. you're not able to just go whenever you want, but you are certainly able to maintain that. Um, the other two op- opportunities that I just I would like to mention, because part of this is this work is still getting the word out, you know, because it is different. It's hard for people to adapt to. The other two things I'd like your listeners to remember is they can also come outside the, the reservation season, right? They can sure. push their visitation to just not the busy time of the year. I'm sure you've done that plenty. Lots of winter visits to parks in Utah, for instance. And then the other thing that's possible is all these parks have, virtually all these parks have, you know, day before reservations available. Um, And it certainly at at some times of the year, there's like quite a lot of those day before reservations that are available for folks to hop on um, recreation.gov and secure a reservation. In fact, we found that data collected at Arches National Park is that Pretty much all visitors were able to get reservations for when they wanted to, but if they weren't, they were able to get a reservation for sometime, you know, nearby, whether it's just the next day or a slightly different time of day. And they reported that making those small adjustments didn't really affect the quality of their experience, right? They really found that it's still they still had a wonderful experience. It was slightly different than what they expected, but um they were it didn't impact it negatively. Yeah, yeah. You know, you mentioned the, the windows um, when you need a reservation and, and outside of those windows. Do you know, has there been an increase in people trying to come into the parks before that reservation window officially opens? This is a huge challenge. And this is one that NPCA encourages the National Park Service to always think about um, as they put consider making these pilots permanent. Right. And and putting some bounds around them, they the flexibility to change the hours or the requirements of the reservation system is so important because you'll see folks over time as these systems gain popularity and understanding people figure out how to game the system, too. Sure. (laughs) So they come in early. Um, This has been a problem at Glacier National Park at Logan um, Pass and people coming in before the reservation requirement and virtually filling up the parking lot before the people who, you know, had a reservation are even exactly. allowed to come in the park. And that's, exactly. you can imagine, immensely frustrating for those visitors. But it's a good reason to kind of like dial up, you know, or work back in time, make earlier the re- requirement for the reservation. Um, so we've definitely, and I imagine we will continue to see things like that. Many more people coming at night. Um, at the end, or just certainly in like the late afternoon, which could create its own congestion problems, um, and, and and frequently does. The superintendent at Glacier National Park has mentioned that he can kind of seize the queue starting for right when the reservation system ends, um, and all those people rush into the park all at once to apply for the same few parking spots. So. Yes is the short answer to your question, and that's why keeping these systems adaptive to kind of adjust to how visitation patterns change given to people, giving people coping with the system is going to be just so essential. Have you seen any changes in that regard? I mean, you know, the, the Bear, Bear Lake parking area is pretty small. You know, you look at Arches National Park, all the parking lot outside of the visitor center lot are pretty small. Um, we're talking about um, reservation system at uh, Mount Rainier this summer. Um, Paradise is fairly good in size, but there's still a lot of people. You know, if it's a sunny day, everybody from Seattle comes over, everybody from Tacoma comes over. And if you want to game that system and get an early jump, how many spots in the parking lot are left for the people with a reservation? That's right. So, the approach taken at Rocky Mountain National Park um, over the course of the last, you know, like four years. So they've had opportunities to adjust their system start in 2020 all the way up through 2023. The reason they came up with the idea of a park entry timed system, as well as the Bear Lake Corridor, is kind of to adjust to that phenomenon that 
while Rocky is big and there's a lot of places to go, a lot of people really want to go to Bear Lake. And they were not able to solve the parking and traffic and congestion problems at Bear Lake by controlling entry, right? Or managing entry. So they had to create these two systems. And by all accounts, doing that and creating those two different systems has has helped make the Bear Lake corridor kind of visitor experience conditions, you know, sustainable and workable. So that's mm-hmm. one approach that we've certainly seen in the parks take. And one of the benefits that, that Rocky has been able to rely upon are the shuttle buses coming in from Estes Park or the Bear, the Bear Meadows, Bear Entrance. Yeah. And shuttles are a great complement for sure, to these reservation systems. I would be curious, this is now me just positing because I think, you know, some of the gaming of the system motivators are good when folks um, are interested for in like a really long day hike, right? And they're going to, they need to get there early in order to wrap up their hike before the sun sets. And then they're in a parking spot all day though, right? They've left their vehicle there all day. So I sometimes, I I wonder if for those sorts of like recreational uses, if things like shuttles or other kinds of approaches can help just try to ease some of those challenges of of small parking lots and really desirable places for very different kinds of users, front country and back country users. And then I'd wonder if you would need a reservation to get on the bus. So when that last bus leaves, they know, oh, there's, you know, half dozen hikers still out on the trail someplace and it's a long walk back to Estes Park from Bear Lake. Yeah. Yeah. Sure enough. Or at least expanded shuttle service, right. Which is kind of a different tactic here. You know, we're spending some time talking about reservations today, but that's certainly a different and important visitor use management tactic in kind of expanding that transportation. Um, It's a great one. It's something that a lot of folks we hear so much are so excited about also very expensive and that gets into a whole different kind of like bucket of challenges it's another podcast (laughs) um all right we are nearing the end of our time cassidy i'm curious mount rainier is the latest to jump in um old at shenandoah national park they announced that the old rag pilot program is over with and they're going to move ahead forward with requiring tickets during uh, the, the, the high season. What else is coming down the line? Can you, can you tell us anything? It's interesting that at Yosemite, um, it's, it's a general entrance that they're going to be using, and yet you've got the mist trail that could be dangerous if there's too many people there. I mean, any, any insights into you know, whether there might be a reservation system for the mist trail or, or anywhere else in the park system? Grand Canyon is another one that uh, easily overflows. Oh, that's such a... I, I wish that I were that privy. I Come would on. certainly share it with you if I got that kind of level of insight from people at the park service. Uh, so I'm afraid I don't know. I don't have any kind of like hot off the presses information. Mount Rainier just happened this week. So it is probably like the biggest story. Um, I will say that I would advocate for one thing and I would expect another. The thing I'm really advocating for and the NPC is really advocating for is that some of these parks where their managed access systems are working and they've, you know, learned from their pilots and they've created great adaptive measures. We would really like to see those parks moving towards making these systems permanent. Pilots are such excellent opportunities for learning and data collection. And also we'd like to see parks be able to kind of move forward with the next phases of planning so that they can, the visitors know what to expect, the communities know what to expect, and everyone can just really adapt long-term rather than waiting to hear if another year of a pilot will be authorized. So I really hope to see those sorts of formal public processes roll out at places like, you know, Rocky is underway, but they'll certainly, you know, have a decision at some point in the next year. Um, But I'd I'd like to see things like that happen at places where the data is sound and the systems are working. Um, I also think we will see is more and hope we will see is more parks that are not yet struggling with their 
numbers of visitation, their capacity, is there numbers at certain times of the day or the year? Really think about visitor use management planning, and they certainly are, but I think this proactive planning and excellent excellent plans for data collection so that they can employ tactics when they need it is so vital. So, you know, landscapes like Capitol Reef and, you know, the Black Canyon. I know. Can I say those things in this no. podcast? I hope not. You can edit that out. We, we, um, need to keep, we need to keep some spontaneity out there in the field. And and those managers are certainly thinking about the fact that um, you know, folks folks will folks are discovering them, they will continue to discover them and they really need to to be ready to accept visitors where it's kind of reasonable and also think about what kinds of tactics they might employ um to make sure that the visitor experience is preserved, kept really high quality and the resources are protected as well. Um, when they do become the next big thing. Yeah, and, and to your point about protecting the resources, the Park Service doesn't always have enough staff to protect the resources. With climate change, we're seeing some seasons grow longer, start earlier in the year and stretch further into the fall, perhaps at times before a park has its full complement of seasonal employees. Mm-hmm. Might might we see some of these timed entry systems be employed not so much to control congestion in the parks, but to reflect the limited staff, the limited park service staff to protect the resources and the visitor at certain times of the year? I think it's absolutely an upset of having uh, the infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean technological infrastructure, managerial infrastructure, public knowledge infrastructure in place for managing access for all kinds of reasons. You know, if we have a really limited kind of staffing season. Great reason to do it as the climate changes, as you mentioned, a great reason to do it. Um, uh, we think a little bit in this new kind of era of managing visitors um, or resource protection, I think about wildlife and crepuscular creatures that maybe are not going to adapt very well to the fact that there's a lot of visitors coming very early in the day or very late at night. Do we have the tools that can also, if that becomes a problem, can adjust and make sure that we are quickly amending the pat the patterns in the park? So I just think there's a lot of great potential for having some investment, some understanding, and some great science on these systems. That's Cassidy Jones. She is a senior visitation program manager for the National Parks Conservation Association. She's keeping her fingers on what the Park Service is doing in terms of managing congestion in the parks. Cassidy, thanks so much for joining us today. We'll have to um, join up down the road sometime and and see how these um, pilot programs are working and what other um, approaches the Park Service might be taking to address both congestion as well as protection of natural resources. Count me in. Thank you. That's our show for this week. We hope you found it interesting. Keep an eye on the Traveler website for information on any other parks that move to implement reservation systems. While they might stifle spontaneity in travel, they can make your park experience more predictable and enjoyable. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Rappencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.